May I request you all, please fold your hands in prayer pose, close your eyes gently, breathe in. Om Rim Namo Arhanta Welcome, 20th anniversary workshop. Uh, it doesn't feel so long, but uh, it's quite amazing, and in a way it's a special occasion. And I'm very pleased to see so many of you coming here who are not giving a paper, but who have been part of the, the venture for many years. This is, of course, not just a, a SOAS conference, but it is a, a Jane Studies Network conference. So, one has to say that uh, quite clearly. I mean, the topic of this year's uh, proceedings also came quite naturally because there are a number of uh, connected um, events, projects, etc., which uh, actually uh, called for a self-reflective uh, topic. First of all, we completed, of course, the Jaina Omasticon from CLAT last year we launched this massive volume which is no doubt a milestone of <laughs> we can celebrate it every year again of uh, jaina studies completed a hundred and what is it 40 years ago and finally came out then there is the brill encyclopedia on which uh, everyone in the room probably works at the moment <laughs> and uh, i think the uh, editors, which will tell us more about it tomorrow, see it as a kind of summing up of the state of art in Jaina studies at the moment. And uh, then there is, uh, of course, uh, the change in generation of scholars in, in job, in situ, because, uh, I mean, a, a generation of uh, uh, teachers with, uh, in, in employment will retire, no doubt, within the next 10 years, and whether their posts uh, will be filled or simply cut, uh, we will have to see. In India, uh, uh, Jaina studies as an academic subject doesn't exist anymore, one could say, except some pockets here and there, uh, such as the uh, monastic university, uh, Jain Vishwabharti, and so on and so forth. Uh, that, so there is something really to discuss I think, and we have uh, a few innovative ideas. We have two discussion forums tomorrow, and uh, one on the Brill Encyclopedia, one on the state and future of Jaina studies. And of course, we have some wonderful celebrations because uh, the uh, uh, Shravana Bella Gona Bhatt uh, will present the winner uh, or bestow the winner of its 
2017 prize, famous Prakrit prize tomorrow. And we don't reveal the name, of course, yet, but Hampana is ready, and uh, we all look forward to that one. Um, uh, the proceedings will be started today by the lecture, the annual Jane lecture by Eva de Klerk. However, as uh, so often, things don't go to plan and her son fell sick and she can't be here in person. However, with the help of Charles, Charles, why don't you show yourself, our new executive <laughs> center of programs officer. <laughs> he, he does a wonderful job. And uh, he set up everything uh, possible here in, in technological wizardry. So she will be present via Skype, and we hope it will all go well. Um, pre uh, questions are not allowed, as usual, as you know by now, uh, learning the hard way. Um, and uh, we we'll shall see how that goes. Um, I have to thank the sponsors, of course, which are this year mainly the universities that sponsor the uh, travel fair and the accommodation of the speakers, and uh, three organizations who in the last minute helped covering our uh, expenses, and this is the Jane Vishwabhati London, the Jeev Daya Foundation, and of course the Shravana Belagola Mata. For the first time we received some funding from them, which is, I think, also worth noting because without funding, after all, we cannot have the conference dinners, most important. Okay, um, I have to say something about the sponsorship, since it's our 20th anniversary lecture, I want to say something. Whenever I travel uh, to places, uh, academic or Jain, people ask me, so who is funding actually the Jain Center? Which, which Jain family is, is funding the Jain Center? And I said, well, absolutely no one. And I said, what? I just have no one is funding this. Um, I said, of course, we get for the conferences uh, some sums. They're all on the sponsors list. If you go on the web page, you know, every penny is uh, basically accounted for. And uh, since I'm also on the to be retired list within the next 10 years, I would like to flag up the necessity of endowing the chair at SOAS as well. And uh, to strengthen the case, uh, I've invited one of our uh, regulars from Detroit, Dr. Manish Mehta, to give a five-minute presentation on the fantastic successes in fundraising for JNA positions in the United States. Uh, Manish, where are you? Jai Janand, everybody, and Pranam, and Peter, thank you very much. You were going to co-present this with me, now you put uh, me in the spot. No, I have to actually <laughs> It is my great pleasure to be here before you, and, and especially such a distinguished uh, and accomplished audience, so I'm, I'm just nobody. All I do is work uh, with Jaina. I represent Jaina this, uh, this uh, wonderful evening to help improve the interactions and continue the interactions and outreach between the 70 Jane centers across North America and Canada. Uh, in the U.S. and Canada that we have uh, with uh, our British brothers and sisters and many others who have come here from other countries uh, across Europe and India. So, so it is my pleasure to be able to give you this very quick report. Uh, if we can advance this to the next slide, I want to give a lot of credit to Dr. Suleik Jain, who is the complete driving force and motivator for the, the kind of academic liaison work going on in North America. And, and I, I'm, I'm really doing very poor justice to the kind of passion and uh, enthusiasm and energy that he brings even at age 80 to the world of Jain academic studies in North America. And we just got off the phone this afternoon with him. He is pursuing three more uh, unique uh, chair professorships in North America to, to endow and sponsor Jain studies and uh, research activities. So let's really quickly take this report to the next slide, which has just a little bit of statistical details about what we have done in the last approximately eight to 10 years, with the majority of the progress uh, being achieved in literally the next three to five years at best. But it had to start somewhere. It started with bringing the scholars uh, together. It started with ISJS, the International School for Jain Studies, which brings students 
students that immersive cultural, social, and scholarly uh, opportunity to interact with Jains. So with all that, we have been able to work with uh, uh, successful business and academic and entrepreneurship uh, uh, members of the Jaina community across North America and fund, for example, three chair professorships in Jainism at University of California at Irvine campus. There's a position open there. Any budding PhD dissertation or postdoc, uh, uh, you know, individuals are uh, encouraged to, to apply um, with all the accomplishments that you have. Uh, at University of California Riverside and UC Davis, each of these has been funded at least a million dollars today uh, to be able to be uh, supporting uh, the students into perpetuity uh, for their Jain academic-based research and uh, travel and other grants that would uh, help sustain these uh, scholarships and then the chair professorships. So then we also have four full professorships in Jain studies currently at Florida International University where JVB also has a strong presence. We have Samnijis there, but we also have Stephen Woz, I believe, was going to be here. Uh, uh, University of North Texas, uh, Emory University, Loyola Marymount University, two postdoctoral fellowships in Jainism at Rice University and University of Texas, Austin, uh, one center for Jain and Sikh studies that we share and co-fund at Loyola Marymount University. And then there are 14 centers for Jain studies where classes in Jain uh, research, academic uh, way of life uh, uh, topics are, are offered, uh, conflict and peace resolution, for example, uh, in states such as uh, Pennsylvania, California, Texas, Massachusetts, Illinois, uh, Connecticut, and also in uh, uh, Ottawa University um, in uh, Canada. And then there are so many overseas centers that contribute students to this ISJS initiative, uh, as well as partner with Jaina and come to our Jain conventions. So I just want to leave with a very quick uh, invitation. There, there are two opportunities to interact with Jaina this year. One is July 4th weekend in uh, Chicago, Illinois, at the Young Jains of America convention. And next year, 2019, the same July 4th uh, Independence Day weekend for us, uh, in Los Angeles, where the Jaina Convention will uh, be held. I think it's the 20th Jaina Convention. So there are some parallels here with the 20th uh, Jain Studies Workshop. So with that, I want to thank you all very much for your time and uh, patience. And Peter, congratulations on pulling off 20 years. So what it comes down to now, parting words is my challenge to our Jain brothers and sisters here. Humbly, please do something to sustain the phenomenal activity going on here that will keep us coming together and sharing, uh, you know, and celebrating really Jain studies and, and graduating even more uh, scholars and academicians on this very, very important way of preserving our culture and way of life. And please, my UK brothers and sisters, this is the best opportunity to help support what, what is going on at SOAS through similar types of professorships. Thank you all, Jay Janendra, and wish you a successful conference. Um, thank you for this impassionate support for the course, and therefore I would like to call upon Professor Wright to uh, give out the student prize, uh, BA essay student prize for 2017, and uh, I pass on to Professor Wright. And I, in turn, call on Alex Maidment uh, in, <coughs> to receive a token of the award. Hi. So I now have pleasure in, in uh, awarding you the uh, certificate for your essay on the, uh, uh, the uh, position of women in giant life, the, uh, 19, uh, the 2017 prize. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Well, now we, we, we get to serious business and uh, the uh, tricky issue of putting Ever de Klerk, Professor Ever de Klerk, into this room will be tried in a minute. But first, let us have a proper introduction um, of her work and personality by Dr. Renate Söhne Thieme here of SOAS. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great, great pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker of the 20th anniversary China Studies Workshop, Professor Eva de Klerk from the University of Ghent, one of the rare experts um, in the Prakrit and uh, upper Bransha languages and their literatures, which are so important for China Studies. She is actually no stranger to SOAS, where she had held a seminar in 2008 on giant narratives in multilingual early modern North India, upper Bransha texts from the 15th to 18th centuries, in which I was one of the participants. And she took part with papers in three previous Jaina studies workshops, the sixth on Jaina doctrines and dialogues already in 2004, discussing doctrinal elements in Swayambhu Deva's Paumacharyu, the 13th in, uh, to, uh, uh, in 2011 on Jaina narratives, and the 16th in 2014 on Jaina hagiography and biography. I actually met her first at one of our triennial conferences of the Sanskrit epics and Puranas in Dubrovnik 2002, where she introduced us to the giant Ramayana Puranas, of which I had at that time not yet taken much notice. She took part again in these Dubrovnik conferences in 2005 and 2008, with papers on the giant Harivansha, which focused on different aspects related to it. In 2008, she also conducted a workshop on exchanges between Hindu and Jain Harivansha's new dimensions from epic and narrative sources. This concentrated on Hindu influences on Jaina narrative, and it induced me to look contrarywise for Jaina influences on texts of the Hindu tradition, resulting in my own contribution to the next Dubrovnik conference 2011, which she unfortunately did not attend, and to the 16th Jaina workshop in 2014, when we last met. She started her academic career actually with a graduation, the graduation thesis, approximately comparable to an MA dissertation here, on a section of the Valmiki Ramayana before she concentrated on the giant upper Bransha version of the Ramayana, the Paumacharyu of Swayambhu Deva, which was to be the topic of her PhD thesis. Ever since then, she has devoted her research to the giant versions of the Hindu epic Puranic traditions and to new aspects of various topics rising up from the Hindu epics, especially the Ramayana, in the light of the giant traditions to which her lectures and seminars at various universities in Europe, Würzburg, München, Bonn, Hamburg, Paris, Budapest, etc., and elsewhere, Toronto, are devoted as well as contributions to international conferences published in the corresponding proceedings and articles in journals and edited books. Her latest publication, 2018, is concerned with the topic of her PhD thesis, Swayambhu Devas Paumacharyu. It is an, actually an English translation which eventually gets published, <laughs> it's getting published. In her lecture tonight, she will discuss the significance of the Ramayana for the Jaina tradition, but conversely also the importance of Jaina contributions to the Indian Ramayana traditions in general. So I would like to ask her now to come and give her lecture on Jainism and the Ramayana, but, but, but where is she? Um, so good evening, everyone.
everybody. Um, and my apologies that I cannot be there with you um, in person tonight. Um, and I want to thank uh, Charles and Tina, especially for the Skype support. Um, and of course, um, my sincere gratitude to Peter for giving me this opportunity tonight um, to share with you from my main research subject uh, for the last almost 19 years, that is the Jain Ramayanas. Um, now, in view of the theme of this year's annual workshop, I will address the history of the study of the Jain Ramayanas, discuss some of their main features and conclude with some observations from a Ramayana studies approach. But before we do all of that, I will begin by introducing the corpus of texts central to this research and give some general background information. So um, I begin with this uh, schematic representation, which I hope you, know, you are seeing right now. Um, so this is from the introduction to the edition of the Paumacharya. The edition is a revised edition by Muni Punya Vijayaji from 1962 of the original of Herman Jacobi. Um, the introduction to the edition was written in 1959 by V.M. Kulkarni, a scholar who for his doctoral thesis made a comparative study of the narrative material of a number of Jain Rama stories for the University of Bombay in 1952. The results of this uh, were published in a number of articles, um, especially in the Journal of the Oriental Institute in Baroda, and then finally combined in a book comparing 11 works published by Saraswati Pustak Bandar in uh, Ahmedabad in 1990. By examining the Rama stories, Pulkarni distinguished between two principal forms of the Jain Rama narrative. One, that of Vimalasuri's Paumacharya, the main Jain Ramayana, with 11 compositions mentioned that are said to follow this narrative, and two, that of Gunabhadra in the Uttara Purana, who was followed by at least two later authors. Now, apart from these two, there are the accounts of the Rama story in the Vasudeva Hindi and in Harishina's Brihat Katha Kosha, which Kulkarni here takes together as exceptions um, and as stories which do not belong to either of the two traditions. K.R. Chandra, who authored a critical study of the Paumacharyam, sees some importance in some commonalities that exist between the Vasudeva Hindi and the Uttara Purana, and therefore considers them two currents of one tradition. So we will take a closer look at some of these texts in a minute. Now, despite there being at least two different narrative traditions, um, there are things that um, all Jain Ramayanas have in common. The first is um, Rama, Lakshmana, and Ravana are considered the eight Baladeva, Vasudeva, and Prativasudeva of this half cycle Avasarpini um, in the Tirtha of the 20th Tirthakara Muni Suvrata. These categories of Baladevas, Vasudevas, and Prativasudevas are sets of nine heroes and anti heroes who live simultaneously, their lives intertwined. Together, they are 27 of the 63 Shalaka Purushas, the others being the 24 Tirtankaras and the 12 Chakravartins. Their combined biographies form the so-called Jain universal history and are composed in literary works termed Puranas or Charitras. As the names of the categories make clear, the biographies of Balarama and Krishna, Vasudeva, must have been the inspiration of the Baladeva, Vasudeva, and Prativasudeva category. The Baladeva is always the older half-brother to the Vasudeva, and the Vasudeva ends up killing their mortal enemy, the Prativasudeva. So here, Lakshmana kills Ravana with the legendary chakra Sudarshana, and not Rama with arrows. The second important commonality has to do with the characterization of the Rakshasas and the Vanaras. In the Jain narratives, they are not demons and monkeys, but humans belonging to two distinct branches of the Vidyadhara dynasty. How this Vidyadhara dynasty came into being is narrated in the biography of the first Tirthankara Rishabha, which is very often included in the Jain Ramayanas. Rishabha, himself the founder of the Ikshvaku dynasty of Ayodhya and thus direct forefather to Rama, at the time of his renunciation had divided his realm among his relatives. However, two relatives, Nami and Vinami, were absent of this, at this occasion. 
Later, when Rishabha was already immersed in meditation, the two some approached him and claimed their land. Their presence near Rishabha and the danger they posed to his meditation alerted Dharanendra, the lord of the Nagas, a class of serpent deities. He appeared there and offered the two men vidyas and a territory consisting of the two ranges of the Vaitadya mountains. Hence, their dynasty becomes known as that of the Vidyadaras, the Vidya bearers. Generations later, the Rakshasas and Vanaras became two closely allied branches within this dynasty. These Vidyas are portrayed as a kind of supernatural female entities, somewhat similar to genies, granting the person who possesses them certain powers, such as the power to change one's appearance, to change one's size, etc. These Vidyas are inherited through one's family, but they can also be gained through performing austerities. There are also occasions where vidyas are simply donated by one person to another. Incidentally, Rama and Lakshmana are also described as possessing some vidyas, although they are not part of the Vidyadara dynasty. Now, coming back to our Rakshasas and Vanaras. As Vidyadaras, the Vanaras are named Vanaras or monkeys because their ancestral island is Vanaradvipa, and they have a monkey as their emblem in their flag. The explanation for the name Rakshasa varies. Some authors say they are named after an early ancestor called Rakshas. Others say the name is linked to a Vidya called Rakshasi and an island called Rakshasa Dvipa, uh, which were donated to Toya Dalahana, the first king of the Rakshasa dynasty. Now, in the second tradition of uh, Gunabhadra, however, the Vanaras and Rakshasas do not manifest themselves as such until they are opposite each other on the battlefield in Lanka. Then, the generic Vidyadaras in Rama's camp take on the form of monkeys, and the Vidyadaras in Ravana's camp take on the form of demonic Rakshasas. This transformation of the Vanaras and Rakshasas into humans is generally recognized as a tendency by the Jain authors to rationalize the story of Valmiki. While this tendency is certainly very much present, rationalizing incredible elements of the non-Jain versions was not the only strategy employed by the Jain authors, as we shall see shortly. Now, back to our text. Contrary to, for instance, the story of Krishna, there is no Jain version of the Ramayana in the Agama, though there are some references to the Ramayana, but those tend to be in the context of mithyatva or false doctrine. Nevertheless, according to tradition, it is assumed that the stories were a part of the Drishtivada, a part of the canon which was lost at a fairly early date. They are, moreover, part of a corpus of texts called Pratamanu Yoga, a class of post-canonical compositions dealing with legends of the Dirtankaras, kings, etc. Both Shvetambaras and Digambaras have such a post-canonical corpus. Given the fact that there is agreement among all Jain authors regarding Rama, Lakshmana and Ravana's identity as Shalaka Purushas and the Vanaras and Rakshasas as Vidyadaras, it seems that there was a consensus on a Jain Rama story in a phase predating the earliest available texts. Um, the oldest full version of a Jain Ramayana is the Paumacharya or Padmacharita of Bhimala Subri. It is an epic poem consisting of 118 chapters composed in Maharashtra Prakrit, mostly in the Aryan meat. The reference to Rama as Padma in the title is explained as to avoid confusion with Balarama, the ninth Baladeva. In the text, Padma is also often called Rama, um, or his well-known epithets such as Raghava, Dasharati, etc. From the text, the sect of the author is not 100% clear, but most likely he was a Shvetambara monk. His monastic lineage is named to be the Naila Vamsha, and it's thought, uh, he is thought to have lived around Mathura at the time when the strict division between the two sects uh, was not yet consolidated, perhaps the third or fourth century. A lot is unclear about his date and time. Chandra believes the Paumacharya to date from the fifth century and that the Vasudeva Hindi predates it. The structure of the text is roughly as follows. 
So first, the narrative setting. Because we are dealing with the Jain Purana, the text is embedded in the authoritative and sacred Jain Puranic setting of the Samavasarana, or sacred preaching, of Mahavira, in Rajagriha, where King Srinika is present. The story of Rama is told at the request of Srinika. The narrative then begins with the biography of Rishabha, the founder of the Ikshvaku dynasty, and includes the story of Bharata, the first Chakravartin, and his fight with Bhakwali. Then we learn about the history of the Rakshasa and Vanara dynasties. Here, several chapters are devoted to the depiction of the greatness of the Prativasudeva Ravana, an Arda Chakravartin, and his conquest of half the world, his Digvijaya. This is followed by the story of the birth and life of Hanuman, son of Pavananjaya, allied to Ravana and his mother Anjana Sundari. Then, after a short break narrating the life of Muni Suvrata, the 20th Jinnah, we come to the Ramayana proper, with a description of Ayodhya, King Dasharatha and his queens, the birth of their sons, and subsequent, the subsequent marriage of Rama to Sita. The intrigues of Kaikeyi lead to Rama's banishment to to the forest, and during their stay in the forest, Sita is abducted by Ravana. Rama finds allies in Sugriva and the other Vanaras, including Hanuman, all of whom were actually close to Rama. Hanuman goes to Lanka, where he finds Sita. Upon Hanuman's return, Rama and the Vanaras prepare to attack Ravana and Lanka. After a long battle with multiple jewels, eventually Lakshmana kills Ravana with the latter's own chakra, Sudarshana. Lakshmana now becomes the new owner of the chakra and will thus become the new Arda Chakravarti. In due course, the three sons return to Ayodhya, where Lakshmana and Rama become Arda Chakravartins, and in time Sita is banished to the forest. Luckily, she is found and brought to the city of Pundarikapura, where she gives birth to twin boys. After the twins encounter Rama and Lakshmana in battle, they are united with them, whereupon Sugriva convinces Rama to take Sita back after a fire ordeal, which she passes. Instead of joining Rama, Sita renounces the world to become a nun. This is followed by a lengthy account of the previous lives of the main characters, who thereafter pass away one by one. Like Ravana, Lakshmana goes to hell, whereas Rama ends up renouncing the world and attaining omniscience and liberation. So now back to the scheme of, um, of Kulkarni. The second text in the tradition of Vimalasuri, the Padma Purana, is a Sanskrit version of basically the same narrative. It was composed in 678 uh, by the Digambara Ravishena. This particular text is ranked as very authoritative among the secondary canon of the Digambaras. Aside from the Paumacharya and the Ramacharitra, um, also mentioned here, um, all the other works mentioned um, in this list are compositions which deal with broader subjects and which happen to include a Jain Rama narrative. This also holds true for the second tradition of Unabhadra. Particularly noteworthy are, of course, Hima Chandra's account in his Trishakti Shalaka Purusha Charitra, dating from the 12th century, and the Uttara Purana of Gunabhadra, dating from the 9th. Um, Kulkarni lists some additional Jain uh, Ramayana compositions and added to, do to those mentioned by Kamil Bulka and by Banerjee, a total of 57 individual Jain Ramakatha compositions were identified. Of course, there may be more. Um, now that we have looked at the text and discussed some of their very general characteristics, it is time to take a brief look at scholarly engagement with these texts um, and what some of the observations of these scholars are. I should note that my overview is by no means exhaustive, but that it should provide you with at least an idea of what has been studied and from what perspective. The earliest reference I found to an edition of a Jain Ramayana is Winternitz's mention of the edition of Book 7 of Himachandra's Trishakti Shalaka Purusha Charita as Himachandra's Rama Charita or Jain Ramatna from Pune in um, 1890. It is possible, or at least Winternitz assumes this, that this edition was used by Dinesh Chandrasen for his book, the Bengali Ramayanas. 
which is a publication based on lectures held in 1916. In this study, Sin argues that there would have been originally two separate Ramayana narratives, a northern Aryan one dealing with Rama and his banishment, without any mention of Ravana or Vanaras, and a southern Dravidian narrative focusing on Ravana, the Rakshasas, and the Vanaras. In the Jain Ramayanas, represented by the version of Himachandra, Sen sees uh, remnants of this original southern narrative because of the way in which Ravana, the Rakshasas, and the Panaras are depicted in it. Moreover, Hemachandra, like Pivalasuri and Ravishtina, begins his account of the Rama story with the description of the Vanaras and the Rakshasas, and describes them at great length. In the Valmiki Ramayana, the birth and rise of Ravana and Hanuman are only found in the last book, the Uttarakamma. Two years prior to Sen's lectures, in 1914, a first edition of the Pomuchayam of Vimalasuri was published from Bhavnagar, edited by Herman Jacobi. This edition was later revised by Muni Punya Vijayaji and published, along with a Hindi translation, um, in the Prakrit Text Society series. In a few separate articles, Jacobi discusses the date, language, etc. Uh, of Vimalasuri. Aside from his work on Jainism, Herman Jacobi was also a very renowned scholar of the Valmiki Ramayana, authoring several articles on the issue, as well as the seminal book Das Ramayana uh, from 1893. Das Ramayana is a philological study discussing in particular the different layers, recensions, and growth of the epic. It contains some stray references to Jainism in the influence it may have had on the development of the Valmiki Ramayana, but in his book, Jacobi does not engage with the Jain versions of the story. In his Geschichte der Indischen Literatur Winterwitz, so from uh, 1909 to 1922, devotes several pages to describing and paraphrasing Vimalasturi's Pomacharya. In a footnote, he informs us that he obtained all this detailed information from the abridged translation that his friend uh, Ernst Leumann had prepared of chapters 1 to 31. And indeed, the catalog of Leumann's unpublished papers refers to an abridged translation up to chapter 33, as well as a glossary and several papers on its grammar, meter, and the author. Leumann seems to have used edi um, Jacobi's edition along with another manuscript of the text's work. Ernst Leumann's student, Nikolaus Mironov, in 1903, made a study uh, of the Dharma Pariksha, a Jain narrative in which two Vidyadaras ridicule other faiths, faiths, especially the Brahmins, and their incredible stories in their Puranas and epics, after which they represent, uh, present the Jain true version of the story. Mironov mentions that he has compared the elements of the Jain version of the Ramayana with a manuscript of Ravishena's Padma Purana. This manuscript was part of a collection of Digambara texts procured by Leumann for the Universitäts- und Landesbibliothek of uh, Strasbourg, as described in an article from 1897. In the decades following this early period, Jain Ramayanas were edited in India, often accompanied by Hindi translation uh, for instance, Ravishena's Padma Purana in the 50s, the Paumacharyu of Swayambhu uh, between 53 and 1960, the Uttara Purana in 54, Shpadanta's Maha Puradu uh, between 1937 and 1941, and of course, Alan Johnston's translation of Book 7 of Himachandra's work in 1954. So that's what to in that series. Studies of the text were made, and noteworthy here is an early, ar early article from 1934 by Nara Char in Indian Historical Portuguese, and the studies of Kulkarni and Chandra, whom I already referred to. The Jain Ramayanas were also included in broader studies of the Ramayana tradition, such as that of Kamil Bulka, his uh, Ramkatha Utpat or uh, also in John Brockington's Righteous Rama from 1984 and in Paula Richmond's edited volume Many Ramayanas from 1985. In addition, general reference, reference books on Jainism, like those of Paul Douglas and Padmanabh Jaini, just to also deal with the Jain Ramayanas. 
Lastly, two articles by John Court and Padmanabh Jaini on the Jain Puranas, published together in edited volume Purana Pereni in 1993, on the Jain Ramayanas from within the Jain Puranic genre. These different scholars have each dealt with these texts in their own way. Regarding their origin, their finding the origin of the Jain Ramayanas, two views have been proposed. Some state that these were entirely new compositions created deliberately by Jain authors to counter the vitality of the Brahminical uh, story of Rama. Others hold that there may very likely have been Rama stories or legends current among Jains prior to the rise of Rama from a temporary hero to a type of vision. That these new compositions were reactions against the appropriation of Rama. Whatever may have been the case, most scholars concur that Jain Mayanas were at least to a degree composed to confront texts of rural traditions, such as that represented by the Valmiki Ramayana, and that the narrative was adapted to Jain setting, with the main character Rama portrayed as non-violent. I will now discuss these last two characteristics in more detail. The confrontational character of the Jain Rama stories is exemplified in passages explicitly rejecting the non-Jain versions. At least four compositions include such rejections. I will take Ravishena's Padma Purana here as an example. Like Vimala Suri, Ravishena commences his work with a description of narrative setting. In Raja Griha, King Shrinika is attending the sacred preaching of Makvira. After a day of sermons on the Dharma, Srinika it is the on the teachings. As soon as he awakes, his mind turns to his personal doubts on what he has heard about the Ramayana. And then I read the text. And he thought of the Dharma as it was accordingly explained by Gira, particularly regarding the existence of Chakravartis and other heroes. Then his mind went to the biography of some doubt arose concerning the Rakshasas and the monkeys. How is it that in popular scripture one hears of the Rakshasas, Ravana and the others, who according to the teachings of the great Jinnah were as men, a good creed, wise and their spirits illumined by their vidyas, eating and drinking fats, meat, etc. Ravana's mighty brother Kumbhakarna allegedly slept continuously for six months, come by terrible slumber. Even when rutting elephants trampled him, or when his ears were filled with cotton full of hot oil, even when a deafening sound of drums and it is said he did not wake up before the time of six months had passed. And when that big belly, unstoppable Rakshasa woke up, oh, he ate what he saw before him. Elephants said. When he had satisfied himself, Men and gods fell asleep again, devoid of any further human truths. Alas, foolish bad poets narrating the bad scriptures have brought infamy on the Tvidyadra prince. Supposedly, Ravana overthrew the king of the gods with fatal arrows discharged from his ear. Where is that king of the gods? Where is this wretched man who at the mere thought of that Indra reduced to a heap of ashes? He who, who possesses the elephant Airavata and the great thunderbolt as his weapon. Who can support the earth with Mount Miku and oceans with ease. How could that king of the inhabitants of the heavens be ruined by a mere human of little Vidya power? The king of the Rakshasas allegedly took him prisoner and he lived, for, uh, he lived forever well straight in Lanka in dungeon. This is as ridiculous as the killing of a lion by deer. Grinding of rocks with sesame seeds, the killing of a snake by a worm, the slaughtering of an enormous elephant by a dog. Rama, who had taken vows, allegedly killed a golden deer, and Sukriva's older, older brother, who was like a father to couple. All this is untrustworthy and unsubstantiated in evidence. Tomorrow I will ask the Reverend Gautama, the leader of the community. Then Shrinika goes to Gautama the following day and addresses him. Lord, I wish to hear the story of Padma. As the followers of bad ideology have falsely gained down from it. 
Was he a Rakshasa, like a or was he a man possessing vidyas? How could he have been overthrown by animals, simple monkeys? How could he be an eater of putrid human bodies? Or how could Lord Rama have killed Bali through such flawed behavior? Or how could Ravana have gone to the abode of the gods, destroyed the wonderful garden, and put the lord of the gods in prison? How could that younger brother of his, who was skilled in all the theoretical subjects, for six months while his body remained free from disease? How could monkeys construct, construct sufficient high them with extreme heavy mountains that even the gods could not have conquered? And then Indra Bhuti Gautama commences his narration. The first thing which uh, Ravi Shina addresses here is the characterization of the Rakshasas as meat drinking creatures. In particular, he mentions the depiction of Kumbhakarna, and he depicts how this character, the Abra prince, wronged in such a way by these other poets. The author is not specific here, but we may assume that a creature such as the Kumbhakarna described in the Valmiki Ramayana could simply not exist, let alone be the brother of mighty king. The portrayal of Ravana can be rejected following the same argumentation, though uh, his depiction as eat, eat, drinking Rakshasa is difficult to run in with his nature as a Brahmin in Vakhtisthi. However, Ravishi does not mention it here. The argumentation continues in the second passage. Here it is moreover questioned that Rakshasas, esque and wicked but very powerful beings, and in particular Ravana, whom Vakhtisthi takes great care to describe as possessing superior physical qualities, were defeated by mere monkeys. More than irrational, it is an inconsistency in the Vamiki Ramayana. The following argument, that is also repeated in the second passage, continues with this notion of a false portrayal of Ravana, this time in connection with his capturing Indra, the king of the gods, as described um, in the Uttarakhanda of the Ramayana. For Ravi Shena, the suggestion defies common sense. It is as ridiculous as deer killing a lion, sesame rock, rock, etc. The Jain texts have a parallel episode for this story. Ravana defeats a rival Vidyadara king named Indra. This Indra was given this name because his mother, during her pregnancy, craved the splendor of the celestial Indra. But this terrestrial Indra's viceroys and generals all come in big gods, such as Agni, Varuna, etc. The dynasty came to be known as the Sulakvam, the dynasty of the gods. And this later gave rise to the false legend of Ravana in Indra, the lord of the gods. The next rejection concerns the popular episode of the golden deer. In Valmiki's Ramayana, Ravana asked the Rakshasa Maricha to take on the form of a golden deer in order to lure Rama away from Sita so that Ravana could ease her. Scholars have assumed that this rejection is to be understood in view of the Jains depicting depiction of Rama as non-violent. But we will see later that this was a rash assumption, because Rama is not always non-violent. Ravishena's verse in itself is clear about the refutation. He rejects the idea of someone wearing the attire of an ascetic, Vrata Prapta, hunting and killing an animal for its hide like a hunter. So here it is again an internal inconsistency of the Ramayana that is explicitly scrutinized. Indeed, in the Valmiki Ramayana itself, tension is present between Rama's martial nature his adopted ascetic lifestyle in later interpolated passages. Note that in Gunabhadra's tradition, the golden deer episode is present, though there is no explicit mention of Rama killing the deer. Uh, the next rejection concerns the killing of Sugriva's brother Ali. This is a morally difficult episode in the Pramik Ramayana. Rama agrees to kill the enemy of his new ally Sugriva, namely his older brother Valin. Valin had banished Sugriva from his city Kishkinda for sitting alone after he had presumed Valin had been killed. Sugriva had to leave behind his wife in Kishkinda. Eventually, Rama, hiding behind some shrubs, fate Valin while he was engaged in a duel with Sugriva. 
Some scholars have again too hastily assumed that this episode is here rejected because the Jain authors sought to liberate Rama from the sin of murder. However, in the parallel passage of the text, the tradition of Bhimala Suri, Rama similarly pursues an alliance with Sugriva and is to help him in his fight against his enemy. In this case, Sugriva's enemy is not his brother Vali. Earlier in the narrative, we had already learned that Valin had renounced the world, leading with Sugriva. Here, Sugriva's enemy is a Maya Sugriva, Foster, the rejected suitor of Sugriva's wife. With the support of Rama, Sugriva challenges this Maya Sugriva. And when he is able to identify the imposter, Rama kills him with an arrow in combat. In view of this, and by reading Rabbi Shena's words more closely, it is clear that here too, the act of an ascetic, Rama, committing murder is rejected as an internal inconsistency. Moreover, the idea of fratricide is also essentially imputed. Sugriva asked Rama to kill his own brother. How could such a person be considered a hero? Uh, the woman mentioned here may refer to Ruma, Sugriva's wife. Um, who had stayed behind in Kishkinda when the Greek had fled. Or it may refer to Tara, Valen's wife. There are a few passages in the Ramayana hinting that Sukriva had more than brotherly feelings for his sister-in-law. Um, for instance, in 458, uh, uh, yeah, Sukriva counts the story the animosity with Valen. Valen had gone in pursuit of a demon and followed him in after a long time, Sugriva presumed Valin to have died and walked up the cave and returned to the city. Now, in his narration, Tuba let slip that after he had abandoned the cave, he had become King Shida and had taken Kara as his wife. Moreover, there is a statement in 428.4 which describes how Sugriva, during the monsoon, surrenders himself completely to lust with his wife Ruma, who won back. And also Tara, who Tara. So perhaps this lusting after Tara was an additional reason for Sugriva to want Valin to do it. In any case, Sugriva's character is not unblemished. Um, the flawed behavior, and the Sanskrit word is chidra, mentioned in the second part, is most likely a reference to the way in which Rama killed Valin on befitting Kshatriya. I will come back to Rama and the idea of his non-violence at the end of my talk. Um, the second passage contains one additional rejection, namely that of monkeys building the causeway to Lanka, again considered as something defying common sense. The rejections of Ravishena more or less coincide with those expressed by Vipastupi. In addition, Swayambhu Deva and Pushpadanta also in a similar formulate criticisms. Um, of the other versions of the Rama story. They both reject the idea of Ravana as Dashamukha, um, having ten heads. The Jain narratives contain an account rationalizing how Ravana uh, came to be called the Dashamukha or ten feet. The ancestral necklace of Toya the Vahana with nine gemstones representing the nine planets was kept in the treasury and protected by terrible snakes. As a toddler, Ravana one day wandered into the treasury, fearlessly took the necklace and put it around his neck, whereupon his face reflected in the gemstones. Seeing the child's complete disregard for danger, his relatives predicted he would become an exceptional ruler and gave him the epithet ten faced, referring to his reflection in the gems. Interestingly, Swayambhu Deva includes some rejections connected to Rama's identification with Vishnu, the first is the ancient belief that the earth is carried by a tortoise, an association already present in the Brahmanas and later developed into the Kurmavatara. A second, more obvious refutation of Vaishnava theology is found in the rejected idea that Rama, being Vishnu, holds the world in his belly. These ideas are both rejected, um, uh, are both disposed of as illogical. Other motives defying common sense here are the idea that Vibhishana is immortal, and indeed Valmiki's Ramayana describes how he obtains immortality from 
Brahma after performing austerities, and the idea that Indrajit is older than his father Ravana. This last purportedly false story is not found in the common editions of the Valmiki Ramayana. However, the Dharma Pariksha also mentions it for elaborately. Here it is said that Brahmins believe that Madodari conceived after contact with the semen of her father, that fetus remained in her womb for 7,000 years, and that she only gave birth to the child Indrajit after her marriage to Ravana. The closest corresponding account I could find to this um, story is from uh, Ranganatha's Ramayana in Telu, which tells of an Apsaras Madhura who was impregnated by Shiva. Parvati cursed Madhura to turn into a frog that fell down a well. After 12 years, she turned into a young girl, Mandodari, a gift from Maya, who was performing penance near the well to obtain a daughter. Later, she was given as a wife to Ratna. Only after her marriage, Shiva's semen inside her became active and she gave birth to Indrajit, Shiva's son. The notion of the long pregnancy of Mandodari is most likely related to the Imoki uh, upper name as the one possessing a slow Mata Um A less obvious uh, one is the rejection of Rama fighting Kara and Dushana. In the Valmiki Ramayana, after Lakshmana had mutilated Shurpanaka, Kara and Dushana uh, come with their Rakshasa armies to take revenge. Seeing them approaching, Rama tells Lakshmana to stay with Sita while he goes off to battle the Rakshasas. For Swayambhu, it would have been more proper for the younger and subordinate brother, Bhritya, to do the fighting, as he does in the Jain version. Swayambhu's last rejection is the mention of Vibhishana, that Vibhishana took Madhodari as his wife after Rab's death. Moreover, after first forsaking his brother for loving another man's wife. This is indeed described in the Valmiki Ramayana. In the society represented by the older layers of the Ramayana, the practice of ni yoga, where a, wit a widow remarries her brother-in-law, is still accepted. In later stages, this custom disappeared, and as you know, widow remarriage became considered extremely inauspicious. The two remaining refutations of Pushpadanta are well known in Hindu versions of the Ramayana. In the Jain accounts, Ravana is a devout Jain, and it is Lakshmana, the Vasudeva, um, who kills Ravana. In the case of Pushpadanta, you could indeed argue that he wants to portray Rama as non-violent, for in the Balin episode in this tradition, it is Lakshmana who kills the adversary, and not Rama. Pushpadanta explicitly mentions Valmiki and Vyasa as the sources of this disinformation. The other authors speak in more general terms of popular teaching of this Luya Sati Lokta, Ramayanas composed by several authors or preachers of my teachings, Kushastra Vadim. Aside from the Jains, many other authors and commentators also have expressed their doubts about some of the more questionable episodes of the Ramayana, such as the death of Valin, the killing of the golden deer, the mutilated Shurpanaka, Rama's banishment of Sita, and the killing of the Shudra Shabuka. In her book, Questioning Ramayanas, Paula Richmond holds that the element of questioning has always been an intrinsic part of the Ramayana tradition, and that this questioning has been the key factor in the multiplicity of the Ramayana. To deal with these difficult episodes, authors from varied backgrounds all over South Asia and far beyond compose their own versions. This questioning is moreover connected to the political messages that are intrinsic to every Rama narrative. Because the Ramayana tradition embodies normative behavior for the individual, with Rama as the Mariada Purushottama, and gives the standard for ideal kingship in Rama's rule, Ramaraja. In view of this, the controversial episodes in which Rama's behavior does not neatly correspond to the Dharma ideal have led to additions, commentarial explanations, reinterpretations, and of course, new adaptations of the story. Some Rama tellings, such as that of Valmiki, are considered more authoritative in that they have a wide audience, represent an elite in society, and firm existing social order, whereas others are considered more oppositional in that they offer alternative perspectives. 
When applied to the Jain Ramayanas, they certainly present alternative perspectives and even explicitly reject those offered by the Brahminical elites. With regard to the political message thought to underline these stories, in particular the Jain's engagement with Rama Raja and the idea of Rama as Mariada Purushottama, these two are to a degree rejected and replaced by the ideals represented by the Baladeva and the Vasudeva. Just like the other Baladevas and Vasudevas, after their return to Ayodhya, Rama and Lakshmana are both consecrated as kings, and each rule over half of Bharata as Ardha Chakravartins. The symbolism of the Ardha Chakravartin is pronounced only with regard to Lakshmana, the Vasudeva. While Lakshmana sets out on his Digvijaya, world conquest, he does so together with Rama. What can be seen as a rejection of the idea of Rama Raja is that in some texts, when after Rama's return, Bharata renounces the world, other kings first approach Rama to ascend the throne. Rama refuses, saying Lakshmana should be the new king. A few verses later, however, both Rama and Lakshmana are consecrated simultaneously as Baladeva and Vasudeva, with their first wives, Sita and Vishalya, as chief queens. But then, when viceroys need to be installed in the different regions of the empire, it is Rama who takes the initiative. By contrast, in the parallel biographies of the ninth Baladeva and Vasudeva, Balarama hardly takes any initiative at all. So there are certainly echoes of the Ramarajya ideal. In the ensuing Digvijaya, however, Lakshmana takes the lead. Like all Vasudevas, Lakshmana goes to hell in his next life, whereas Rama, like all Baladevas, except the last, renounces the world, his omniscience, and rape. This brings us back to the perception among several scholars of the Jain Rama as non-violent. Unlike Valmiki's Rama, the Jain Rama does not kill Ravana, um, and he thus attains liberation, whereas Lakshmana, who kills Ravana, goes to hell. But as we have seen, this assumption does not hold. Rama may be the less violent of the two brothers and less dedicated to worldly pleasures than Lakshmana. Lakshmana has 16,000 wives, Rama only has 8,000 wives. He still engages in battle and is even explicitly described as the killer of Sugriva's enemy. Then what accounts for the stark difference in fate between the two? Is it only down to Rama renouncing the world and Lakshmana dying before he has a chance to do the same? The answer to this lies in what makes these Jain Ramayanas truly Jain, namely the story of their previous lives. Uh, and here I come back to the subject of last year's annual lecture by Professor Shin Fujinaga, the subject of Nidana, or sinful resolution. About the Baladeva and Vasudeva, Tiluya Panati says the following, and um, so Anidana Gada Savi Baladeva Kistva Dana Gada Udhamgami Savi Baladeva Kistva Aguda. All Baladevas have come without a Nidana. Keshavas or Vasudevas have come with a Nidana. All Baladevas go to heaven or go up. Keshavas go to hell. The story of the previous births of Rama and Lakshmana is narrated by a monk towards the end of the Jain Ramayanas, following the renunciation of Sita. It is as follows. In a previous life, Sita was a merchant daughter, Gunavati, and she was to marry the merchant's son, Anadatta, who was Rama. Her greedy mother, however, secretly betrothed her to the Shrishti Shrikanta, who became Ravana. When Anadatta's younger brother, Vasudatta, Lakshmana, heard about this, he attacked Shrikanta, and the two ended up killing each other. The two were then reborn in a long sequence of several animal rebirths, along with Gunamati's soul, um, as a female for which they ended up killing each other birth after birth. Dhanadatta was shocked by his brother's death and accepted the vows of a Jain layman, and after a life in heaven was reborn as a merchant's son, Padvaraj, who had recited the Pancha Namaskara mantra to a dying bull. That bull, who, was, who would later become Sugriva, was re reborn prince, who later recognized his benefactor from a previous life and bestowed great, great wealth upon him. After dying and spending a life in heaven, Padma Ruchi then becomes uh, Rayanananda, who renounced the world and is then reborn in Mahindra Kalpa, 
was again born on earth as Sri Chanda, who also renounces the world to become the Indra of Brahmaloka. Sri Kanta, so Ravana, was eventually reborn as a Swayamhu and Vasudatta as his Purohita. Unamati, Sita, was reborn as the daughter of the Purohita, Vegapati. Swayamhu had asked his Purohita for Vegavati's hand in marriage, but was refused because he had the wrong faith. Swayamhu then proceeded to rape Vegavati and kill her father. Vegavati swore that she would cause the death of Swayamhu in future life. She became a nun and went to heaven. After some lower existences in hell and as animals, Swayamhu was reborn as Prabhasa Kunda. He became a monk and one day observed the wealth of a Vidyadra king and appropriated the Nidana to also become a Vidyadra king in a future life. The Purohita was reborn in heaven and afterwards as the Vidyadra Punarvasu, who also became a monk and prior to his death appropriated the Nidana to marry the girl who would later become his wife Vishalya. These stories bring some perspective on the karmic burden of Rama and Lakshmana respectively. In his previous lives, Rama's soul was characterized by benevolence and detachment, first as a Jain layman and with several lives ending in renunciation. Lakshmana's previous life, on the other hand, were marked by extreme violence. His penultimate life as a human ended in renunciation, tarnished by a nidana, bringing about bad karma in his life with Lakshmana and leading him to hell. Nevertheless, even violent characters like, like Lakshmana and Ravana can be redeemed. When their time in hell is up, they will coexist in many more births on earth and in heaven until Ravana will become a Tirthankara, with Sita as his Ganadhara. And Lakshmana will re be reborn in the uh, Purva Videha of Pushkaradvipa as a Chakravartin who will later then become a Tirthankara. Most chain authors did not alter the killer of Sugriva's enemy to Lakshmana, except the Uttara Purana, where it is indeed Lakshmana. Perhaps the authors deliberately sought to keep the story like this to underline uh, Rama's martial nature as a future Ara Chakravarti, or perhaps changing the killer of Sugriva's enemy would have made the Jain Rama too far removed from the other Rama the audience would have undoubtedly be familiar with or perhaps against the background of the element of questioning as inherent to the Ramayana traditions, the Jain authors too perhaps chose to represent even their own Rama as committing at least one questionable act. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>